I am a professional futurist, not afraid, don't apologize. We are a rare breed these days, but growing slowly. The Association of Professional Futurists has now about 350 members across the world, largely in North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, places like that, and uh, we're extending into some of these others. Uh, 30 years, I was the director of the Master of Science degree in Studies of the Future and Strategic Foresight at the University of Houston. Uh, really a privilege. I wish I could say that that was the result of a gigantic plan and vision, and as I mentioned later on, plans and visions are over, over, overrated. I actually stumbled upon this by total accident. Came to Houston to teach statistics, which I did for five or six years, and this program was already there. I hung out with the faculty. After a while, I said, gee, I got a degree in sociology. I've studied social change. I could do a little bit of this myself. And 30 years later, I retired as the director of that program. So it's really been a terrific career. And as John Lynn says, teach the future is now my mission. Uh, against my better judgment, I've decided to become a leader <laughs> as opposed to an to a academic uh, college professor. And uh, I have more, to, more, have more to say about that in a moment. So the issue of the future is, uh, is an interesting one. It's fascinated human civilization since recorded time. And we have all kinds of different manners of doing it. Strategic foresight is a new version of this to, to a large extent. And the reason that it's coming today in our generation is that if you haven't noticed, the speed of change is picking up its speed and the complexity of problems and issues that we're dealing with have now increased by orders of magnitude. The old way of dealing with the future was traditional forecasting, extrapolation, and waiting until change occurred so that we would be sure when it came time to act. The word today is, if you wait, you're late. So we talk about anticipating the future rather than knowing for sure what is going to happen, which of course involves a tremendous degree of uncertainty. And that's where we come in. Futurists are not the people who hide the uncertainty. Traditional forecasting hides the uncertainty. Basically, here's your future, thank you very much, give me your money, I'm out of here. No, we're people who say, no, you have to deal with the fact that you do not know, and you have to act anyway. And people say, well, I can't do that. You've got to tell me what the future is before I can make a decision. And I say, no, unfortunately, these days, that's why you get the big bucks. You have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. And that's what distinguishes strategic foresight from traditional forecasting as it was developed in the 20th century. Uh, and I'm proud to be part of this movement. It really is a brand new or a, a highly different intellectual pursuit compared to the way we used to deal with the future. But the times call for that, and the times require us to be different than we were before. And that's what really what this talk is about. It is possible to know not the future, singular, but it is possible to know the futures. So I have two questions that I'd like to share with you. The first question is, do you have to know the future in order to be successful? Obviously, what I've just given away is, no, not the future. You can know some of the futures. And let me share with you, if you want to take notes, this will be on the slides that will be available. Ken and the library has these available for you later on. There are seven recommendations that I make. And if I can remember all seven of these by heart, I will, be, I will feel really good. Uh, number one is that... Um, is the concept that John Lynn mentioned, the concept of weak signals. Weak signals are the signs of change, the things that could, not will, but could emerge uh, and change the future. What's the opposite of a weak signal, of course, is a strong signal. So we have a lot of strong signals in our world today. Technology, demographics, the aging of society, the browning of America, the, t uh, the globalization of the economy, all of those are strong signals. And we don't ignore those. We use those in planning too. But weak signals are about trying to figure out what could happen, not what we know for sure will happen. Now is that a risky business? Yes. Do you get it wrong sometimes? Not even sometimes. You get it wrong most of the time. In fact, most weak signals do not change the future. But once in a while, the one out of 10 does, and that's the one that we've paid attention to, so you 
your organization, your community, is more prepared for the change that comes about as a result of that. So weak signals is something that we talk about, but we have a very low batting average. Weak signals are usually weak. They basically go away after a while. They don't change the future. We take uh, comfort, however, in the fact that venture capitalists also have a fairly low batting average. Any of you that know investments and, and, and how that works, 10 investments that a hedge fund or a venture capitalist will make, eight of them lose money. One of them breaks even, and the one that makes money makes so much money that it basically pays for all the rest and a handsome bonus besides. So that's what we're looking for. We allow ourselves to talk about things that we're not sure of in order to be prepared for the things that we are sure of. So weak signals, so we could talk about the recession. Were there signals that the recession was going to, uh, that the housing market was going to collapse? Well, it had never done that before. That was the assumption. That was the belief that the, that the housing market across the U.S., indeed across the world, had never gone down all at the same time. Different regions, different states, different would go up and down. They said, it'll never go down, we're fine. Reminds me because uh, the U University of Houston Clear Lake where I started is next to the NASA Johnson Space Center. And of course we were very involved in those days with the accidents that NASA had, the Challenger accident and the Columbia accident. And you know the Columbia accident were O-rings on the uh, solid rocket boosters that burned through the engineers, and particularly the managers, were, had an assumption. They had burned a lot. Most, most O-rings had burned some, but had never been burned through. It had never happened before. Were those weak signals? Absolutely. Did they pay attention to those? Unfortunately not. The problem with weak signals, however, is that when we go back, we can see we should have known. We should have known about 9-11. I came across a report that's in the, in the presentation that pointed out that the FAA had more than 100 reports of potential terrorist activities a few years before 9-11. 52 of them mentioned Osama bin Laden as the person who was plotting this. Nope, let it go. We had people who were learning how to fly airplanes that didn't want to take off and land. If you're a terrorist, you're going to take over an airplane, you're not taking it off, and certainly you're not landing it. Those are weak signals. It's easy to go back and say, we should have known. Now, let me ask you to turn around into the future. What are the weak signals that you are either paying attention to or not paying attention to? And that's the problem. And we're going to do a little bit of discussion this morning on weak signals. But it is very hard to pay attention because one, one of our assumptions in world is we don't have time for that. I don't have time to talk about nine out of ten things that are not going to happen. But unless we talk about those nine, we are not going to get the tenth one. And unless we talk about all of them, we are not going to be prepared for the change that actually occurs. So my first recommendation then is pay attention to the weak signals. Let's talk about the future though. How do we think about the future? I have to tell you, my daughter started as a teacher, middle school teacher, five years ago. And in the fall semester, early winter, she said, Dad, you're, you're a futurist. What should I be telling my students, seventh and eighth graders, and preparing them for the future? And I said, ask them to think contingently. Think about things that are not necessarily going to happen, but could. Why is that so important? Because in education, what's the whole purpose of education across the board? It's getting the right answer. In math, in science, even in literature and in, in history, we're always asked, you raise your hand when you have the answer. What if there is no answer? What if there are, uh, more, uh, what if there are more answers than one? Do you raise your hand and say, there's no answer? No, of course not. Do you do that at work? No. <laughs> you don't open your mouth unless you know and you're sure of what you are saying because somebody will come along and say, you can't say that, you don't know that for sure. You are allowed at this point to say, yes, I don't know that for sure, but what if it is true? So we're challenging almost cultural, deep cultural prescriptions. To every question there is a right answer. To every problem there is a right solution. 
Not so anymore. Maybe in, maybe in past days it was more true. But today we cannot rely upon and we cannot continue to look for the future, the answer, the solution. So thinking contingently, and when I talk to military people or I talk to law enforcement people, they are trained to do that at the beginning of their careers. A police officer on the street, a commander on the battlefield is always thinking about what, what's going to happen here? What's going to surprise me? How could this go wrong? What assumptions are we making that might end up getting us killed, literally? And then they get into the planning office, into the station house, into the Pentagon, and all that stuff goes away. Around the planning table, certainty trumps uncertainty. A person who says, wait a minute, that may be incorrect. Maybe, listen to the word, may be incorrect. This other thing may happen instead. We may not be understanding the problem as well as we, as well as we think we do. We may think we know more than we do. And where do, how far does that get you? In today's culture, not very far. So one of the things that we're trying to, in terms of a global change, is to allow people to use what English teachers call the subjunctive tense, the tense of possibilities, as opposed to the tense of certainties. Certainty has become the dominant mode in most societies, in most ages, and that is very risky. Because if we are certain, we are almost probably wrong. If we have multiple futures and multiple answers, we have that. We think of it as a cone of expanding plausibilities. The present may be singular, may not. But as the future goes out, the cone gets larger and larger, including more things, 5, 10, 20 years out. Things that we don't expect to happen have a higher probability of happening. Should we all of a sudden rush out and make investments and change laws and all that because of that? Absolutely not. But we should be aware. It's another term from the military. is called situational awareness. Pilots who are flying airliners are under the control of the air traffic controller every single minute. Turn here, turn here, change altitude. All of those things, they never make a move without that command and that permission. But they're still looking out the window. They're still trying to figure out what's going on out there just in case. They're not, are they wasting their time? Absolutely not. They're thinking contingently. What if that command, what if that uh, order to change altitude puts them in touch with another plane? That's what their, their job is, to think contingently like that. So what is the essence of thinking contingently? Let me talk a little bit about assumptions. Assumptions are a very, uh, they have a bad rep in our society. In school we said, do not make assumptions. There was a whole philosophical school in the 20th century that said, we shall make no assumptions. The problem was, the only thing they could say is what was directly in front of them. Not very interesting. This is a dish. Okay, that's not exactly philosophy, right? And where is that dish made of? I don't know because I can't see it. I didn't, I, I'm not, is it China? Is it pewter? Is it whatever? I, I, I can't make that assumption. Way too extreme. But we all kind of think that way today. Do not make assumptions. The problem is, if you don't make assumptions, you can't know anything except what you directly observe. You can't know anything about the future. You can't think about the future. Because even extrapolating a straight trend, world population will be a billion more people in another 10 to 15 years, requires making an assumption. Every single conclusion that we make. So our rule is make assumptions, resolve uncertainty as much as you can, but not more. Challenge assumptions. We're making an assumption here. When, when, you, when, when, when you're talking to someone and, and you say, and you hear, you're making an assumption, that sounds like a criticism. You shouldn't make assumptions. That, that's a, no, that's a, that's a compliment. You, I now know, where, how do we know our own assumptions? How do we know what we're assuming about the future? The only way we know, we don't think of it ourselves, what am I assuming? We can't do that. That's intellectually impossible, or at least extremely difficult. It's kind of like looking at your eyeball. You know, kind of back your head up a little bit and try, no, you can't see your eye because you are using your eye to see everything else. You can't see your assumptions because we're using our assumptions to know everything else. So how do we see our eye? In a mirror. How do we see our assumptions? in a mirror that is a person or a book or a writing that says, you're making an assumption. Here's an alternative. That doesn't mean your assumption is wrong. Remember, it's not one right answer. 
but here is a plausible alternative. This may be true. This is maybe the way things are. And in that sense, we challenge those assumptions. One of the most disastrous cases of not challenging assumptions was the Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Louisiana State University did a plan for the evacuation of New Orleans. And that had on the very first page six assumptions. The very first assumption was the levees will hold. Not, they didn't. That would, New Orleans flooded, below sea level, water was there, devastating, uh, obviously. One of the biggest uh, has, uh, natural catastrophes in the history of our country. It's not that they should not have made those assumptions, exactly what they should have made the assumptions, but then they should have gone the next step and said, but what if they don't? Let's go out and check. Let's talk about what the contingency will be if in terms that comes. In other words, multiple futures. One future in which the levees hold, another future in which the levees don't, and we will take care of both of them. Assumptions have this kind of perverse way of leading us down to what we call the expected future and ignoring the other future. So my hope, and I don't think we'll see it in this generation, is that people around the table, in discussion, in planning, in discussing whatever your units, whatever your organizations do, people are allowed to say, yes, but maybe something else is true. Yes, but maybe we're making an assumption. It's what Peter Senge called a learning organization. A learning organization is an organization that doesn't already have all the answers. That doesn't say, this is how we do it. This is how we have become successful. And true, that is how the organization has become successful. That's our formula. That's our brand. That's our process. We've always done it this way. The O-rings have burned all the time, but never burned through, so we're okay. Not the right kind of thinking. So that an organization allows somebody around the table, sometimes an, an obnoxious person, I have to admit, who says, but what if that's not true? How do we go about doing that? So assumptions are that. So what happens then as a result of paying attention to weak signals, paying attention to assumptions, thinking contingently, and you're going to love this one, tell stories about the future. Stories are an age-old way of communicating important information. We go to the movies. We say, that, that really spoke to me. Or read a poem. Or read a novel. Or hear a story about something. Notice that how many stories are being told in your organizations. When somebody comes in, oh, you should have been there when Gary did and it was so funny. Those become part of the, we're almost like tribes. Those become part of the ritual, part of the lesson, part of the socialization of people into your organization, into your community, is the stories that we tell each other about what happened in the past. Let's use the power of stories to tell each other about what not will happen in the future, because we don't know that but what could happen in the future, and allow ourselves to tell those stories. They're called scenarios, technically. They are all plausible descriptions of alternative, plausible futures. Not saying that they will happen. In fact, their probability of happening as a single scenario is less than the expected future. But as a whole, the probability of something else happening is way more likely than what we expect to happen. And that's the, that's, that's the deal telling stories about scenarios. Now, are scenarios multiple predictions? We know we're not supposed to make one prediction because the future has told us not to do that. So let's do six, hoping that it's kind of like a shotgun. We'll, one of them that will hit the right future. Not even that. What if all the scenarios all turn out not to be true? Is, there, has, is it wasted time? Should we not have done that? Absolutely not. That is not wasted time because it is preparing for change that we don't expect. What is the process of prediction which is wrong rather than getting ready and exercising? So it's like, like calisthenics. I point out to people that jogging is not transportation. You know, if you were as hot and sweaty in an automobile as you are on the trail, you would not be happy. But after you jog, you feel good, you're in condition. So what scenarios do for us is they condition us not only to the reality of change, getting ready for change, but getting ready for changes that we don't expect. So astronauts going to the space station practice all the things that they might have to, the, all the contingencies, and they months and months of training. Well, what if this, and what if that, and what if this? And we're all happy, and they're happy that they have that. When they come back, and from a very successful mission in which none or only a very few of those things ever happened, 
They don't come back and say, boy, that was a waste of time. None of that stuff happened. Why don't you just train us on the contingencies that will happen? And the trainers say, well, unfortunately, sir, we don't know which ones those are, right? But you are now in condition to handle that very complicated machine under various circumstances because you have practiced. Very, the origin of the scenarios in the United States was the Defense Department in the 1950s. With the threat of nuclear war, they realized right off the bat that one of the biggest differences, in addition to the enormous destructive capability of nuclear weapons, was how fast everything was going to take. Up till that point, wars took months, if not years, to execute. And you had months to figure out what you wanted to do as people moved around, and men and material and all that kind of thing. Then you, have, you could get ready for it. Once you saw the missiles on the screen, planning time was over. So they created an exercise, a dynamic. Well, what if they, and what if we, and then they, and then we, okay, let's go again. What if they, and we, and back, and back and forth, and over and over again, simply practicing. Not saying predictions. So that's what scenarios are for. We are allowed to tell stories about plausible futures, which get us into the mindset that we are going to have to deal with a future in our lifetime, in our professional career, that is going to be different and could well be different in ways that we don't expect. So what's the bottom line? I don't think I did all seven, frankly. But nevertheless, the bottom line is not to predict the future. It's the people who are successful are those who learn about change faster than anybody else. If you're in competition, a company that says, this is changing, we can act on that. We're not sure, but we think there's a signal here. We can begin to create contingency plans and do that. Learning faster is really what this is all about. And what prevents us from learning faster? The fact that we get locked into the present and we get locked into the expected future where we expect to be. And I'm not saying the present is wrong or the expected future is wrong. It's just incomplete. We should be looking at the whole cone, all of the futures coming out, learning as fast as possible. And that, you will notice when that happens, when people in your organization or in your community are allowed to say, yes, but we might have to consider something else. And that can go on for a really long time. You don't want to waste a whole lot of time. But if you spend no time in the consideration of alternative scenarios, you are at risk of being caught at risk uh, by one of those. So the question is, do you have to know the future to be successful? The answer is no in the narrow sense but one can talk about and discuss and understand and challenge assumptions and monitor weak signals to be able to do so. The second question, I only have a few more minutes because we want to get to the exercise, is do you have to have a plan to be successful? The answer to that again is no. Eisenhower had a famous phrase uh, that he said, plans are useless. Planning is essential. Discussing what we do and how we are going to go about doing that is extremely important, even though, as he found out, the first day of the battle, the plan was pretty much out the window, and they were making it up as they went along. But the people who had been involved in the planning knew what things were, what resources were, where people were, and they could flex and they could do much better than before. And this is where the concept of wicked problems comes from. A wicked problem is not evil. It's just like we use the word like wicked smart or wicked difficult. We are now confronting a class of problems for which there is no one solution and for which we don't even understand the problem until we actually hit upon a solution or try a solution. How does one deal with that? I think the example today is the state of the Middle East. Geopolitically, militarily, you can't do one thing in the Middle East for good without doing something else for harm. That's a wicked problem. There is no single path to the solution. Remember, here we go again. What's the answer? What's the solution? And for wicked problems, there are no solutions. We basically understand it as we begin to act on it. So again, challenging an assumption, we always think, and the a standard kind of strategic planning mantra is plan and act. Study, plan, act, evaluate, study, plan, act, evaluate. The plan and act do loop, if you will. Uh, there's many, many of those. There is an alternative to that, though, when you are dealing with a wicked problem, and not all problems are wicked, but when you're dealing with a problem that just seems to drive you crazy, there's another whole approach, 
which is called sense and respond. Let's learn. Let's probe. Let's try this. Let's try that. Notice the experimental nature of that. We're not standing up and saying, this is the answer. This is the solution. We've got to have this clear path to get to this outcome. No. We have to begin to feel the problem. We have to begin to, like basketball players, kind of feel the defense against them. They don't know exactly what they're going to do, but they, 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 they basically do the play that the defense gives them. So the, the, the wicked problem gives us the opportunity to sense what's going on, discuss and learn about it, and take kind of baby steps, tentative steps, moving into that space, moving into that solution. Again, not a popular approach. Stand up and say, this is the answer, this is the plan, okay, here we go. Generally doesn't work, and we've got numerous, numerous examples of that. So do you have to know the future to be successful? No, you have to pay attention to, to, to weak signals. You have to scan broadly and look for those throughout the whole of society. You have to think contingently and tell stories and scenarios and learn about change as fast as it possibly can be. Do we have to have a plan, in a traditional strategic plan, to be successful in the future? Again, the answer is no. If the situation is complex, if the situation is new and novel in which we really don't have a clear path, well then don't assert one, don't force one. Don't impose one on the situation. Take time to learn and to probe and to experiment and work out. That's change using it opportunistically rather than charging ahead through some kind of single-minded goal and finding out that that wasn't the problem at all or that wasn't the solution at all. And again, <laughs> there are many, many examples in history and in our current society that you know those simple answers simply don't don't work anymore. Those are the two uh, uh, messages that I come to share with you. That there is a new way of thinking about the future. There is a new way of acting on the future. And those are the two big, two big divisions of foresight. Describing alternative futures in scenarios and stories and learning about how change is going as fast as, fast as anybody else if not faster. And secondly, acting with a degree of humility a degree of tentative experimentation. Let's try this, let's try that. Opportunistically taking a little bit of what the world gives and moving the chess pieces forward kind of one at a time. That in 30 minutes is what foresight is about. You're now, you now have a junior master of science in strategic foresight. <laughs> and yet it is, it, it, we're, we're really creating, I believe, a new discipline. Just like history was created in the Greek era, and computer science was created in the 20th century, and physics was created in the 17th century. So in the late 20th and early 21st century, because of the speed of change and the complexity of the issues we're dealing with, we are going to have to revise our way of dealing with the future. That's what strategic foresight is. And as John Allen mentioned, that's why I have, upon retirement, I don't fish, I don't golf, so I do something. So I created this organization called Teach the Future, which if you believe this is important for you, shouldn't also be important for your kids to learn in high school, in college. A huge mission. I'm not going to see much. We have a couple of schools signed up. We have people who are developing curriculum materials to put in teachers' hands and say, you can teach this. This is, this is doable, and your students will like it, and they will learn more from it, and that's what Teach the Future is about. If anybody is interested in having your kids and your school become part of our movement, absolutely great. But that's what we're trying to do, is not just teaching adults, not just teaching graduate students, not just doing seminars for the Defense Intelligence Agency, whatever, but getting right down into when students are learning how to be in the world this is how they should be thinking about the future and how they should be ready to act on the future. Is that revolution going to take 20 years? No. 50 years? No. 100 years from now, one of my visions is that they look back on our generation. You know, there will be historians of the future that will know you, <laughs> that will talk about you, talk about us in ways that we don't talk about ourselves. And they'll say, you mean you didn't teach them about the future? Didn't you realize they were going to live the rest of their life there? Now, we could say, oh, we don't know what the future, but these principles of thinking contingently and acting experimentally are what I believe are tools for, as important as math and science, as important as teamwork and leadership and all those kinds of things.